Johnny here, and today I'm building a walnut mosaic side table entirely from scrap wood that I found laying around my shop. I'm gonna try some new techniques where I play with grain direction, carve the base, and steam bin wood, and some of those things work out great. Other things, well, they go horribly wrong. Okay, right off the bat, I'm gonna give you guys a spoiler about this video. It ends up being one of the nicest pieces I think I've ever built, and I'm gonna give it away to one of you free of charge. Seriously, I am. With the tessellation builds I've done in the past, and after making a table from paper and then making a table with Kamiko inlay, I've started to notice a pattern. The pattern being, maybe, I love patterns. Also, I love challenging myself to take on new techniques with each build, so I want to try a couple new things. And lately, I've been researching a technique called marquetry, which essentially is a detailed inlay or mosaic of wood. Marquetry furniture gained popularity in 16th century Europe. It's something that I've never done before, but I have done a few epoxy pour inlay patterns, a technique that became popular, well, a little bit more recently, we'll say. And while researching marquetry, I thought it would be really cool to do a marquetry piece based off American traditional tattoo designs, which then led me to do the other thing that I like to do when I'm trying to kill time or I don't have anything to work on. I booked a tattoo appointment thinking this would give me the inspiration I needed to get started on this build and finalize my design. And while I walked out with a rad new piece, it didn't give me my project inspiration. It wasn't until I left the tattoo shop when I saw this new mosaic art mural that had recently been installed on the wall outside. This is a piece by local artist Matt Goad who creates these unique pieces from geometric shapes, sort of like marquetry and wood, but as important as the shapes are, so are those lines and negative spaces between the shapes. This is similar to American traditional tattoos where the line work is usually very bold and a central part of the design. So finally, I had a little spark of an idea for this project, and I jumped right into my 3D modeling software to start sketching it out. I started by creating interlocking rings in a circular pattern and creating a geometric design within that while using the borders to add separation, like in the Matt Goad piece or line work in a tattoo. It's not really marquetry, but maybe some sort of bastardized version of marquetry that I'm calling a mosaic inlay, and this seems like a great way to use up all those scraps that I've had laying around. So far, I've been milling up the wood and resawing the lumber to get the most usable material out of the scrap walnut that I have. And in order to get the most out of my scraps, I'll be assembling this table in a bit of an unusual way. For the top, I'm gluing up some rustic walnut boards to give the top most of the thickness that it needs. Being rustic walnut, I want to hide these boards so the mosaic pieces will get glued on top of this, and then the CNC is scratching in the reference pattern that I'll use to glue on the mosaic pieces later. And I know this seems like an extra step, and it totally is a bit of extra work, but I promise I have a vision for how this table will come together, and this is the best way to do it. Probably. Who knows? I'll tell you what is definitely not the best thing to do. Drive an hour and a half round trip to use your old drum sander that now lives in your buddy's shop in order to get your wood to its proper thicknesses, but here we are and there it is. The mosaic tabletop is made from 80 individual pieces and I'm cutting these out on the CNC as well. And this is where that grain direction is really important. So I pick these boards out carefully based on how straight the grain is, and then in the program that writes the G-code that tells the CNC where to cut, I specifically laid out the pieces on the boards with that grain direction in mind. This is gonna add some depth and some movement to the top, and I don't think this piece would look very dramatic without doing this. I also considered using other species besides walnut. I was able to play around with these different combinations in my modeling software, but ultimately using entirely walnut on the side table, it's just the way to go. So as any of you have seen my recent videos know, I have a new baby girl, Lily, and she is amazing. It seems like every day we see a new milestone. Another thing about having a brand new baby is that she doesn't sleep through the night. So many nights I get up with her to change a diaper or give her a bottle or just hang out with her until she falls back asleep. And most nights, once she finally goes back down again, I'm wide awake, can't get back to sleep. So rather than just toss and turn in bed and bother Katie, a lot of the nights I get up, I go to the other room and I put on a movie. It's kind of cool. I've been working my way through all the classics, and the other night I watched one of the all-time greats. It had amazing characters, memorable dialogue, visually stunning pictures, a real satirical take on feminism and masculinity in the American workplace, and of course I'm talking about Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. Something that I just found out, and maybe all you guys already knew this, but the Anchorman movie that I originally saw in theaters and that everybody knows and loves is not the actual real Anchorman movie. 
The real movie, the movie that they wrote and filmed, is way different. It has this crazy storyline where Maya Rudolph and Chuck D from Public Enemy play bank robbing terrorists. They kidnap Veronica Corningstone and Ron and the news team. They have to turn into like a military style extraction unit to save her life and save all of San Diego, of course. While making the original bank robbing Anchorman movie, all the actors would improv and make extra jokes. The writer and director, Adam McKay, he's actually known for encouraging everyone in his movies to do that. So as the story goes, once they started editing the footage, all that extra stuff that would normally get cut out of the final movie ended up being better than what was in the script. So they took all those outtakes, something that would normally be left on the cutting room floor, and made their movie undeniably better. And that's what I'm hoping to accomplish here. A lot of the pieces of wood that I'm using are from projects I made years ago. So an off-cut piece of walnut that was purchased to make a floating shelf will end up being part of an undeniably better piece of furniture. And I really do think this is going to be a great piece. This should be a cool little table for a living room or an office that you can put candles on or maybe a nice vase or... You know what? This would be the perfect table for a lamp. I love lamp. I love lamp. Before gluing on the pieces, I decided to take a sharpie to the design outline I scratched into the round. This is going to give me a little bit more contrast and should help me glue on the mosaic accurately. Okay, I am really impressed with the quality of the carves that I got off the CNC. I scratched in that pattern so I could kind of see where I need to lay these out, but I do have to do this all by hand. So yeah, wish me luck. So like I mentioned, I'm paying attention to grain direction and that's really important. I was very careful and meticulous in my planning on the layout and naturally I messed up a few. To put everything together, I'm just using wood glue and CA glue, and then I'll pour the epoxy later on, and that's really going to bind everything together nicely. Now, these triangle pieces here are the ones that I messed up. They don't look too bad, but I should have had that grain running at a 45 degree angle, so when I glue these two pieces together, that grain meets in the middle of the triangle. Instead, I had the grain running up and down the pieces, which made cutting these triangles in two pieces completely pointless. I still think it looks good, but it would have looked better had I gotten that right. I'm not worried about it because one, mistakes happen, and two, this mosaic is looking really good. And it's really important for this to be as nice of a table as it could possibly be because, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm giving this away to one of my viewers. One of you watching this video right now can have this side table in your home. And I can't thank you all enough for your support, for watching my videos, for getting subscribed, for buying my merch. So this is my way to say thanks. And I'm not going to make you jump through hoops to win. All you have to do do is be subscribed to this channel and leave a comment below and in a couple of weeks I'll choose a comment at random and boom the table is yours oh and I'm not gonna just limit this giveaway to my US viewers no matter where you are in the world you're eligible to win and I'll ship this to you free of charge and as this table is coming together I'm really digging how it's looking it looks like the drawing that's really cool yeah I'm going to shift gears to working on the table base, and I wish I could say that I had a clear design vision for how this was going to go, but that would be a lie, so I'm just going to wing it. I was all over the map on what I wanted the table base to be. I did know that I wanted the very bottom to be a round, slightly smaller than the top, and I knew I wanted the steam bin wood as part of the base design, but again, I was having serious design block trying to figure out all the details. So I find it's best to just start building and kind of see where that takes you. So I can go ahead and get this part of the base knocked out. And since I didn't have a plan on what to do next, I switched gears again to cutting out the pieces to frame out the tabletop. Essentially, I'm making sort of a segmented ring to go around the mosaic, and normally when you think of segmented ring, you think of turning something on a lathe, but I'm going to cut these pieces out on my CNC. Now, the board I'm using is a chunk of black walnut slab from a skateboard bow tie table that I built, or actually attempted to build a couple years ago. That project was a total fail, and I ended up using it to test the strength of epoxy by dropping a bowling ball on it, and this is one of those broken halves. I really had to nest these segments in tightly to get the eight pieces that I needed, and because of that, there wasn't much room between the segments, and while the CNC was cutting it, they kept breaking off. This left me with a bit of cleanup on the bandsaw and the router table to flush trim it, but even then, I still had some chisel work to get the ends cleaned up where the segments butt up against each other. As I glue these segments up, I wanted to say a quick thanks for buying my merch. You guys seem to love the new maker design and wing it design made by my tattoo artist Brandon Cutter, and if you don't have yours already, I've got that link for you down below. 
I'm really proud of how awesome these shirts turned out. I think anyone can be a maker no matter what you like to do, and often winging it is a huge part of being a maker and life for that matter. So these designs are perfect for everyone. Again, thanks to all of you who've already purchased your shirts and hoodies, and stay tuned because I'll have fresh designs dropping in the coming weeks. All right, back to the table base and I can cut out the round, but I'm also cutting in this relief pocket which will help the table sit level if the floor is uneven. And by now I had figured out what I wanted to do with the rest of the base. Design. I know a lot of my, uh, my CNC projects that I do, they seem like they're wasteful and to an extent they are, but I am a freak about saving every single worthy off cut that I possibly can because I'm like, I never know when I'm gonna need it or at least it's firewood for the fire pit. What am I gonna do with this? What I'm planning on doing, I'm gonna cut these pieces up into uh, squares and I'm gonna glue them up and then I'm gonna power carve a uh, twisting pedestal style base. I need to get all this kind of chopped up into some squares. Most of it is already jointed and planed pretty flat and then I can just start gluing it up I need about 20 inches in height. I think that's gonna work. So I had this vision for a car base design that twists as it rises upward, okay. and I'm gonna build that up with all these scrap pieces that I just cut. To keep everything centered and aligned, I'm marking center and drilling a hole, which I can use with a dowel to keep the pieces lined up during the glue up. A glue up like this is hard to clamp, so I'm just gonna drive screws through each piece of wood to hold everything together. But I'll keep those screws justified towards the center of the board so I don't accidentally carve through them in the next step. I don't have a ton of experience wood carving or power carving. If you saw that snake table I attempted to carve, you saw what a disaster that was. But with this pedestal base, I figured it should be fairly straightforward carving in a twisting base that tapers towards the middle. So that's how I'm gluing it up. Each piece has a slight twist. I figured I would do most of the roughing with my chainsaw first, but this thing was incredibly dull. I've never sharpened a chainsaw blade and I don't have a spare, so pretty quickly I abandoned the chainsaw in favor of this angle grinder and power carving disc. This surprisingly removed material way faster than the chainsaw, but it does leave quite a rough finish. I thought it would be pretty straightforward to carve in the twist, but as you can see, as I carve and blend the layers, the twist pretty much disappeared, and it's more of a straight base that tapers upward from the bottom and transitions from the square to a round on the center and top. I don't know if I'm carving in what the material is giving me or if I'm just that bad at power carving, but I do know I want to be somewhat conservative with how far I carve. Also, I have to worry about going too far and hitting one of those screws. So for this reason, I stopped power carving here as soon as I had the rough shape. I'll just clean up the rest with my sanders. This ended up being about five hours worth of work, but I'm happy I did it this way since it saved me from power carving away too much or making a big mistake by carving in too deep of a gouge. I picked up some lower grit sandpaper, 40 and 60 grit I think, and I'm using my 3 inch and 6 inch Rotex sanders and I shaped the rest of the pedestal. Now like I said, this was a slow process, but in the end I think it looks really good. There's a few cracks and gaps that I'll have to address later on, but I'm digging the overall shape. Although I should have carved the center post before gluing it to the lower round because it took a really long time to feather in those square edges into the bottom round. Thankfully, I didn't leave gouges in the round, which was my biggest concern. Okay, there's a process that I've been wanting to try for years and that's steam bending wood. So that's why I've got these all prepped and ready to go. That's why you see this PVC tube and that's why Weirdly, I have a bottle of downy fabric softener. That is because the wood that I want to steam bend is kiln dried already. Normally you would do this with green wood. I don't have any green wood. So what I've read is, is that if you have kiln dried wood, you need to soften the lignin fibers within the wood. And you do that with water and downy fabric softener. So that's what I'm gonna do. I've got this uh, chamber that I built. This is actually what I originally thought I was gonna use for a steam bending chamber, but I'm gonna build something else. So we'll use this to um, soak these four boards. I'm gonna soak them for a couple days, make sure they're, they're good and soft. 
and uh, hopefully give myself the best opportunity to have a successful steam bin because from what I've seen, what I've read, it's really easy to crack these things as you're trying to bend them. So hopefully this sets me up for success. I like to challenge myself on most builds to add one or two new processes or techniques to my arsenal. So on this build, I wanted to try my hand at steam bending wood. I figured I could just bend some pieces around the pedestal base to give it something extra. So the first thing I'd have to do in order to steam bend wood is to build a steam bending box. I probably make it look more complicated than what it is here, but it's just a simple long skinny plywood box with dowels running through it to support the wood strips getting steam bent. Also, the legs underneath the steam box are offset in height so that the water generated by the steam can drain out the drain hole in the back. And then the drain hole and vent hole in the front are important because I'm not trying to create a high pressure steam chamber here. Steam bending wood is a low pressure process where the goal is to heat and soften the wood fibers. And this is the main reason I chose to build a plywood steam box versus using the PVC pipe contraption that I used to soak the boards in. I'm using this steam bending generator I got from Rockler, and I'll have a link for this down below if you're interested in trying that out. And this kit came with all the hardware that I used to build the box, so that's super convenient. It's pretty easy to use as well. You just add water, plug it in, wait around for 15 minutes wondering if it's gonna work, and then you're pleasantly surprised when it actually starts generating steam. A lot of steam that's super hot and will burn your ass. So if you try this, be careful, or just don't try this. Actually, don't try anything I do. I don't want to be liable. Just watch me almost burn my hands on more than one occasion, but don't try this at home. Again, I've got a link down below if you want to try this at home. I thought the best move was just to use the base wrapped in plastic to bend the wood around and clamp to the base. Then when it dries, it'll spring back so it's offset from the pedestal base, but still maintain the shape that twists around the base. And I underestimated just how difficult clamping to the pedestal base was. You only have about a minute of working time, so that first piece went right back into the steam chamber when I couldn't get it clamped. So then I thought bending it around this 4x4 while they're both clamped in the vise would be the trick, and right away it cracked. So at this point, the steam bending aspect of this build is ruined, but I figured this is still a good time to learn as much as I possibly could about this technique, and I was determined to bend a piece of wood. Just one piece of wood. <laughs> while I managed to actually steam bend wood, I think it's safe to say that was a complete failure. I mean, these two pieces, broke pretty bad, um, this one especially. I, I just think I was bending too thick of wood past its tolerances. I've seen some pretty complex bends. Obviously, I have a lot more to learn about this technique. I'm gonna tackle this again. I really, really think this is a neat technique. I've got a steam box now. I've got a steam generator. It's an interesting process. It's really cool. I just don't know what I'm doing. So I set that aside and got back to working on something a little bit more in my wheelhouse, the tabletop. I needed to carve in an eighth inch border gap on the top. So I'm going to use that trick where I scratch in the circle and then use that same work zero to carve the border so I know it's properly aligned to the top. I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but basically it's the best way that I know to put the table back on the CNC and accurately cut in the border. And those eighth inch gaps are so I can pour in black epoxy. And if you recall, I talked about the mural outside the tattoo shop and traditional tattoo designs where the line work is really important to the design on the piece. So that's what the black epoxy I'm gonna pour will be. Figuratively speaking, this is my line work and it's also literally line work. After pulling the tabletop off the CNC, I need to clean out some of the grooves here before I pour the black epoxy that will lock everything into place. I'm also going to use the old glue and sawdust trick to make the seams in the piece a little more seamless. It's always so satisfying to see how something so simple can yield such great results. Now normally when I seal a tabletop to prep for an epoxy pour, I use Total Boat Gleam. But I've had some issues with that in the last few projects with spots of gleam varnish ending up in the epoxy. So moving forward, I have a new approach where I'll just brush on a thin layer of Total Boat High Performance Epoxy. And this seals the surface and prevents epoxy staining, but it does that better than the gleam varnish. For the actual pour, I'm going to use Total Boat Thick Set Epoxy. This is for 1 inch pours, and my pours aren't that deep but the viscosity is perfect for getting down into all my eighth inch line work. Also, you guys know that Total Boat is my longest running sponsor. I stand by their epoxy. I've been using it for over five years now, and I've got a link down below to the Total Boat website. If you use that link, you will get a discount on everything on the website every single time you purchase. Also, I appreciate when you support Total Boat because that helps support this channel. So thank you for that. 
Epoxy tables used to be trendy, but now the trendy thing is to hate on epoxy tables. And I'm not saying that some of that hate isn't warranted. I think we should be done with the swirly blue and green epoxy river tables, and that's coming from someone who has built his fair share of swirly epoxy river tables. What I believe isn't going away is epoxy itself. It's far too versatile of a material that has cemented its place in furniture making and art. Well, as long as we stop putting swirly glitter in our epoxy, pouring it between two pieces of wood and calling it art. But as a material to design and build around, to do inlays like this, to adhere things together, as a durable finish, epoxy is here for the long haul and I'm for it. So that bent lamination was a total fail, but I, I don't know, I just, I feel like the base needs something. I mean, it looks good, but I just feel like it needs something to just really level it up. So I've been doing a lot of practicing with a ball gouge and this Dremel tool right here. I made this guy, I tried this guy. If you're a tryptophobe, this is definitely gonna trigger that. And this is the one I really like. And I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna kind of blend it up into the base and then I'll have it kind of tendril out towards the top. Hopefully I won't ruin this this table or make it look dumb. So before I take this leap of faith and carve about a billion little dimples into the base, I'm going to carefully mark what I want to carve and what I want to leave clean. Now this was about an hour and a half of carving out the dimples, cut down to about 20 seconds and one prog rock song. Trust me, you did not want to hear the full hour and a half, so you're welcome. This would not be an official Johnny Bills project if I didn't try something that will most likely make all of you viewers at home scream, what the hell are you doing? And if my feeble attempt at bending wood didn't already do that for you, this probably will. While all that wood is walnut, it's from different trees with different grain direction and varied distance between the growth rings. Obviously, each piece looks different when hit with the Dremel. So in order to make it look more cohesive, I'm gonna use spray paint. And I know it seems crazy to use spray paint on a piece like this, but trust me, I know what I'm doing. I mean, I've never done this before, but I know what I'm doing. I was confident this would look good, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that I was second guessing myself here. Even as I sand the spray paint away and blow out the dust, it just doesn't look all that great. There was just too much contrast between the sanded walnut and the black paint and the divots, and right now it kind of looks like a Dalmatian, and I'm really shooting for more of a German short-haired pointer. At this point, I'm relying on the finish to darken the walnut and make it more of a natural transition between the walnut and the black dots. And right now, I'm silently praying to the woodworking gods that I didn't just ruin this whole project with a weird design choice. So powering through, I'm cleaning off the excess epoxy on the CNC, and unlike sanding the black spray paint, this reveal was very satisfying. I've been doing this for about seven years now, and I'm still pleasantly surprised when something goes exactly as planned. And after sanding the remaining epoxy, I can add a round over to the base. I think this was a half inch round over bit, I'm not sure. I'm also doing a round over on the tabletop as well. I'm doing the full half inch round over on the bottom side of the tabletop, and then I dialed it back for about a quarter inch round over on the top. And the reason you're seeing me use two different routers is because I'm a huge proponent of owning as many cordless routers as you can possibly afford, chucking out the bits that you use most, and then never ever removing them. While coming down the home stretch of this bastardized marquetry mosaic side table with a dimple tendril tulip base, I started thinking a little deeper about the entire concept of scrap wood or offcuts. These are not just pieces of wood anymore, at least not to me. As I carve and sand and paint and sand and apply finish over and over and over again, I'm thinking about where these pieces of wood came from, more specifically where they came from in my little world. These are all offcuts from the builds that I've done over the last seven years since I started the Johnny Builds YouTube channel. And some of this wood I bought while I was making my projects on weekends in my garage. Some of the scraps have lived in three different wood shops. They've seen me take big swings, 
fall on my face, get back up, and take even more swings. I've had some of these pieces of walnut longer than I've known my wife, and now we're married and we have a baby. Most of this stuff was sitting in my wood pile when I was still doing Johnny Bills part-time and had a full-time day job on the side. When I look at this table coming together, I can't help but see the original projects that these offcuts came from. The desk that I use every day, the cheese tray that I gave Katie as a gift, the record console that I use to play music from my baby girl Lily, my daughter Chloe's bed, in fact her entire bedroom, and to be honest, I see the last seven years of my life in the offcuts that I use to make this little side table. So my mind can't help but go to the fact that the only reason I have seven years worth of offcuts to begin with is because you guys care enough to watch my videos. So that's why I feel like this table belongs to you and that's why I'm giving it away. Because I fully understand that I'm not here doing what I love every single day without all of your support. So three weeks from the launch of this video, I'll collect all the names of all the people who comment below and I'll do a drawing. Then I'll get in contact with whoever wins and we'll figure out how I can get this table to you free of charge. I'm also gonna start posting a lot of longer cuts, older videos reimagined, shorts, and anything else that doesn't live on the main Johnny Builds YouTube channel to my second channel, Johnny Builds Offcuts. And given this project, that just seems like an appropriate name. So I'll give you an extra entry to win this table by subscribing to Johnny Builds Offcuts and commenting on any one of the videos that I've uploaded over there. Currently, I'm working on several more videos to go on that channel, so you're not gonna wanna miss any of that, so make sure you get subscribed. When I purchased the wood to work on my first walnut project, I could have never dreamed it would take me here. I also never dreamed I would make a table as nice as this one turned out. When I started this project, I was feeling uninspired, but that's ridiculous because if you're lucky enough to get to do what I do for a living, you can never forget, I, I should never forget, that there's inspiration everywhere, especially coming from you. I'm gonna keep challenging myself, I'm gonna keep trying to top myself with every new build, I'm also gonna fail sometimes, but I promise you I'm gonna keep pushing because you guys have inspired me to do so. After the finish, the last step to help protect the table and add extra sheen is to apply this Blacktail Studio N3 Nano finish. This is a newer product out on the market, but it's really amazing how well it protects the table and just how easy it is to apply. I like to say my pieces aren't truly finished until I've applied N3 Nano, and if you're interested, I've got a link for that down below. I always like to know who made it to the end of a video, so if you did, please comment offcuts down below. It'll also help to remind you to go subscribe to my new Johnny Bills Offcuts channel. As always, thank you. And leave a comment below already. I mean, do you want this table or not?